Muy buenos días a todos y todas. Good morning to everyone. We will start hearing number 17 of 181 period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights about human rights situations of women, adolescents, and girls in Venezuela that was requested by different civil society organizations. I am Julissa Mantilla, first vice president. I am joined by Flavia Pivestan, second vice president of the commission and commissioner uh, Esmeralda Rosemena, child health reporter, and the executive secretary, Tania Renault, ADOC uh, monitoring secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, and uh, the special reporter on economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. Before we begin, I want to tell you that we have a digital tool in the platform to register the time that we are using. And we have bilingual interpretation. These hearings are broadcasted live through the different media platforms. And I'm going to request you to keep your microphones muted and your cameras on. We are going to start with the participation of the petitioners. I will ask you to introduce yourselves when you speak and then the state representatives for 20 minutes. Then we will open the floor for the participation of the commission and then the second part of the hearing. So we will start with the petitioners for 20 minutes. Good morning. Greetings to the Honorable Commission, to the Executive Secretary, and the persons that are here today that are watching the hearing. I am Gabriela Boada, and I represent the organization Calidoscopio Humano. For the first time, feminist organizations that work for the rights of women are part of a public hearing to present the situation of violence and discrimination suffered by women, girls, and adolescents in our country. On behalf of all the organizations present here, we want to thank the Commission for giving us this space for which we have uh, fought for a long time. We uh, want to have a consolidated agenda with the Commission and the special rapporteurships amidst a crisis that has uh, put at risk our rights. We are not protected and the crisis that has been exacerbated by the pandemic has caused the collapse of institutions and the vulneration of rights and the impoverishment of the population that is of 94% and extreme poverty 76.7% according to the last national service. And we are witnesses witnessing uh, social inequalities and underlying poverty that affects in a disproportionate way women. According to uh, national organizations, there are women in communities that suffering extreme poverty who have do, that do not have access uh, in their homes for 14 years. Many of them do not have access to health services and have to face the problem of uh, lack of access to food. Many elderly women have to take care of other members of their family and the different programs fostered by the state, such as food baskets are not efficient um, due to the lack of distribution. There is a need for women, girls and adolescents of taking care of uh, their relatives' lack of autonomy over their bodies and reproduction and the constant risk of being victims of certain specific ways of violence that have been exacerbated and normalized in our society. The organic law against violence against women and the last state government quotes some reference towards the uh, gender approach that do not guarantee a specific rights, politizing women as victims of the so-called economic war. Society do not have any official figures. We know data through uh, public media, social media and organizations, but the ones that register and accompany victims are the relatives know that these figures do not stop setbacks and the critical situation that we face today have not only compromised the possibility of reaching gender equality in Venezuela, but also in the whole region, as those have 
who have migrated in a forced way face violence and discrimination that started in the country of origin, which we'll explain later on. I will give the floor to my colleague. Good morning to everyone here present today. My name is Maria Cecilia Ivanez. I am lawyer of the organization Women's Equal Right, and I'm going to speak today on behalf of the organization 100% Estrógeno. I'm here. Selene is here, okay. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is Selene. And as I am part of a 100% Estrogen organization. I'm going to speak about two cases that show the lack of a gender perspective uh, and the lack of recognition of women's rights by the judicial power in Venezuela. The case of Rubellas, a 19-year-old girl that had a relationship with a man who constantly subjected her. She had a baby and she was suffering extreme vulnerability, a psychological, physical violence, sexual violence by, his, by her partner. Nayi said, he took all my clothes and made me sleep on the floor naked in the middle of the night. He raped me. They lived in Meridenio where temperature are minus zero uh, degrees. Also, a victim of sexual violence, she has now a case against her and has been deprived of liberty for several years. She was accused of causing the death of her uh, child. She was constantly beaten as well as her baby. The, there are misogynist prejudices by the officials and she moved from victim to victimizer. Knight has been detained in Merida and she had to face the risk. Her life and her health was at risk. She shows several pathologies and she had 19 resources presented. And finally, she was able to access medical attention. Now we are facing the crisis everyone faces. They didn't have the uh, adequate conditions to carry out medical attention. And I have to point out that after two years of being detained, she never received um, medical forensic attention regarding the physical and psychological um, goons that she suffered. For the commission, these stories of violence against women are not new. Since 2001, the same system has enabled violence in Venezuela. The second case that we need to highlight is human rights defenders case. Vanessa Rosales. She wanted to interrupt her pregnancy to save her life. She had to take up the responsibility imposed by law to access the benefits established as the suspension of the process to, uh, and she was able, and she was freed, but she was accused. The girl did not receive any attention and she was let free and afterward the public prosecutor uh, has ordered her capture, but she's still uh, free. We as a team have been at risk as well. The social, political, humanitarian crisis has our face and we are the ones facing the multiple impacts. I will now give the floor to another colleague. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carolina Godoy. I am the coordinator of gender for the CEPAS organization. In my presentation, I'm going to mention three elements. First one, the lack of official data regarding femicides that took place in our country. Second, the impunity that is related to the investigation of this crime. 
and third, the lack of public policies related to phenomena associated to femicides in Venezuela. The Venezuelan uh, state since 2016 has not presented any official data. Civil society makes an effort to register them to this initiative. CEPAS is part of that with the creation of a digital observatory of femicides. Since January the 1st until September 2021 in Venezuela, 207 femicides were committed and 41 attempts which implies there is a femicide action every 27 hours. In September, there were 30 femicides, seven ch children were uh, became orphans. Most of the victims uh, died because of uh, um, died because of uh, the use of uh, firearms. The arm policy in Venezuela has not been uh, discussed, taking into account women's vulnerability. The risk of vulnerability impunity is very high. In 20 out of 30 cases, there are no witnesses. Our body of police investigation has strategic um, plans to capture um, and punish the actors when their witnesses pointed out to them. They lack technical scientific resources and the practical training regarding violence that's due of women due to violent reasons. We highlight that femicides result in situations about we require a cross-sectional approach. For example, the situation of orphans as a result of the mother of their mothers the policy to control firearms with a gender perspective and the use of a firearm by violent officers. Prevention is the only way to detain femicide violence. It requires political will, applying laws and investing in organizations. I want to once again thank you for this space. Good morning. Greetings to honorable commissioners of the commission. I am here represented at the organization Vida Jurídica, and today I will talk about the failures of the criminal justice systems in terms of violence against women. In Venezuela, women face uh, huge levels of lack of protection when they try to access justice and there is the lack of the adequate attention by state institutions. There are four areas of concern. One of them has to do with the lack of protection and the lack of visibilization of protection measures uh, for victims when they request protection. Second, the lack of reply or responses by following a fair proceeding, the lack of training with a gender perspective that includes a transversal approach within the criminal justice system, the lack of statistics regarding reports, complaints, and the execution or the issuance of judgments. In terms of gender violence, this seems really serious because what is not being um, counted is not considered for its prevention. Only feminicide is the only crime that seems to exist, while there are other crimes that are not made visible. Also, the re-victimization of women when they report uh, prevent them from requesting access to justice. Seven out of 10 women decide not to report violence because of the failures of the justice system in Venezuela. And the women that are most affected are those that are in extreme poverty. When they decide to report, it's impossible to reach the institutions because of the challenges that I will explain right now. First, there is no social protection because we have also a scarcity of fuel and of gas in our country right now. And we have electricity cuts and therefore people are not able to move uh, to the buildings 
or to the institutions, or sometimes the institutions are not working because these electricity cuts. Sometimes when they are in the building, the institutions do not have the paper to process those reports. Then we have the denial of the report or the complaint. This occurs when officials do not have a gender perspective. So they have prejudices. There is a high level of impunity and a lack of reply in judicial proceedings when the person is requesting protection. And also there is a bad functioning of the proceedings. We see that there are long delays and we see that uh, some cases are uh, diverted or stopped because of the lack of competence. competence. And officials do not have a gender perspective and there is no protocol that could help them as a guide. That's all. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague. You're on mute, Mrs. Ophelia. Thank you. Good morning to all. My name is Ophelia Alvarez. I'm director of Humana Mujer organization. And I would like to talk about the different types of psychosocial attention uh, because uh, for women that have suffered gender violence we see that there is a crisis in Venezuela of all sorts here and the state is not providing responses. They are doing nothing to prevent that escalation of failures that, ex that exist. Second, there are other situations that are very serious. For example, these women are uh, the head of their families and they face several barriers that lead to several types of violence. For example, those types of violence exerted by brothers, father, parents, or other or partners who decided to go back to their homes. These women are in charge of their children. They are being uh, bad treated by their partners or by other male uh, family members. Also, we see that there are failures in transport, a lack of gas, and there is no way to follow up the reports that these women present. Sometimes their reports or their complaints are not being recorded. In 2020, there is a survey published by Funda Mujer regarding the situation of women um this um indicated that 43 percent of women that presented a report had done a previous report or a pre had filed a previous complaint in 2021 according to the follow-up of our ngo we see that uh, there are several aggressors who are members of the armed forces or police officers they attack using threats uh, their partners in order to control and to persecute them. And women are being tried by military courts instead of common courts. This is usually the situation of women journalists. We also see that there is an increase in digital harassment. 82% of the women who have filed a report also filed, uh, said that there is an increase in violence in institutions. The women human rights are being violated, a right to life without any type of violence. Treaties are not being enforced. There are no public policies because the government says that it's a feminist government, but it's not like that. We have a humanitarian crisis that is also affecting our women. They suffer discrimination. Thank you for this opportunity. Now I would like to give the floor to my one of my colleagues. Good morning. My name is Melanie Agrinsoni. I'm an activist and feminist from Kira. And I would like to talk about the situation of 
trans persons in our country. I have a colleague who was um, expelled from where she, uh, she lived. Violence against women is worse during crisis, but we see that this violence also affects women that belong to vulnerable sectors. The state of Venezuela denies in a systematic way the rights of the LGBTI plus population and especially trans women are the most affected. I would like to point out four important points. By understanding that there is no official data and that access to information is based on media outlets and the testimonies of trans women with whom we are working. One, identity. I am a foreigner in my own country. That is was what one of our LGBTI uh, uh, women says. Trans women have no access to the right of identity. And this leads to a series of violations of their rights. Second, hormones. The crisis um, prevents access to hormones because there is an scarcity, but a scarcity, but also because they are really expensive. Three, sexual work. In Venezuela, there is no legislation that protects sexual workers. Trans women, because of the emergency and because of the historical discrimination that they face, and because of the lack of public policies, need to uh, perform them or to work as sexual workers in order to survive. Four, in Kira, we have recorded four cases of murders of uh, trans women. The state is not legislating, is not recognizing the identity of trans women and is not creating policies for trans women. And therefore, they are responsible for their murder and their uh, discrimination and also the violation of their rights. We are talking about queer and non binary people in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the civil society has run out of time. Now I would like to give the floor to the state, uh, to the permanent mission. Good morning. Can we ask for some additional minutes? You will have another round to participate. You will have some additional minutes to um, supplement the information you have provided. We are going to also give our civil society organizations some time from our time. First, I would like to greet the authorities of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And also I would like to greet my friends and colleagues, Julissa, Esmeralda, Soledad, and the Executive Secretary, Tania, and also to Maria Claudia, and we would like to greet all the staff members of the ICHR. I want to reiterate my gratitude, not only for inviting us to this hearing, but also for the work that they are doing in Venezuela, where my country, where there is a huge human rights crisis. I would like to thank you for all the attention that you are paying to the situation in our country. I also would like to greet Mesa and Laura, who are members of the permanent mission of Venezuela before the OAS. And I also would like to thank civil society organizations from Venezuela for the opportunity of allowing us to have a dialogue and to learn us, to help us learn about the situation that you are experiencing and that you are denouncing. And I would like to thank you for all the figures and the statistics that you have provided regarding the serious situation that Gabriela and all the women have reported regarding the situation of, for example, trans women that sometimes are being forgotten. In terms of the rights of women, Venezuela has a lot to do in the future. This is something that is rather obvious. And this uh, has been happening 
even before the political or economic crisis that we are living right now. And it seems that Venezuela is stagnated in terms of the expansion of women's rights. And we're just talking about formal part because sometimes we have the laws and the institutions, but there is a huge gap between the norm and the reality. In order uh, to improve things, it's important to guarantee that women are able to participate in decision-making spaces. That's a fundamental issue. Men cannot decide on the rights of women. This is a problem that affects Venezuelans as a whole. And therefore, when uh, decisions are being made in the legislative branch or in the executive branch or in the judiciary, uh, women's participation should be guaranteed so that the voices of the persons that will be the beneficiaries of the rights are taken into consideration. And this shouldn't be a testimony. They should be involved in their decisions. Uh, it is true to say that the state of Venezuela has the duty of guaranteeing women's rights, but they are not doing so. You are organizations for the defense of women's rights, and you are doing a huge work regarding training, research, regarding the situation of violence against women. It seems that the, may, uh, the male population is not listening to women. Some of you have the courage to speak, and media outlets are starting to listen to words such as complaint for human rights violations. And that's why you are being heard and you should be taken into consideration by the state. In the area of health, I will not repeat the figures that I have because you have already mentioned them, but we see that there is serious violations of your rights, especially for girls, women. We see that there is a huge health crisis that affects especially women. The experience or everything that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic is a huge concern. And uh, the percentage of women that are suffering violence is worrisome. I don't want to speak too much since uh, we have discussed this many times with the commissioners and the members of the ICHR. And I don't want to repeat to the members of the women's organization some things that you have already said. Uh, our Permanent mission in the OAS is always ready to participate. When these hearings were on site, we have two tables, one with the petitioners and another table for the state or where the state was supposed to be. That's the way the space was distributed at the time. Now that is not obvious, but um. I should give you a response, but because of the situation in our country, I do not respond to the government in Venezuela, but I am well aware, as I said, about the situation of human rights, especially the rights of women, which uh, deteriorated even before the humanitarian crisis. And uh, once the crisis in Venezuela is over, uh, we should start working to improve this, but we don't have no guarantees that after Nicolas Maduro is out, uh, outed, we don't have no guarantees that women's rights will be guaranteed. So we will have to work together. Sometimes human beings act in the wrong way. 
and women's rights are not being protected. And we are going to face that situation when we have a democratic government in Venezuela and the role of the commission will be very important in the future. We Now we are going to demand this to the dictatorship, but we are going to demand this to future governments. I don't want to speak much more in order for you to give you some space. And we are going to do the same during our second round. Um, I wanted to tell you that I started the hearing with a red tie and now I'm wearing a green tie to show my solidarity with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I understand that the participation of the state is over now. I believe we can move on to the co comments made by the commission and we will use this time in order to keep on exchanging our comments. I will now give the floor. Please, uh, I request the team to take down note of the remaining time. I will give the floor to Commissioner Piovesan now. Thank you, Madam First Vice President. I want to greet respectfully all civil society organizations that represent all women Before this commission, most of us are women. Five out of seven members of the commission are women. This is historical. The executive secretary is a woman as well. Two ad hoc secretaries are women as well. Our special reporter is a woman as well. So we are on positions that are very important in the decision-making process. So I want to greet you for the commission this is a strategic space to foster this struggle for the uh, for your rights and justice i also want to greet the commitment of the permanent mission of the bolivarian republic of venezuela before the oes as a special rapporteur for lgbti persons rights i took down notes of what you said of with great concern regarding the situation of lack of protection of trans women regarding trans femicides. And I would like to better understand, to gather more information regarding the measures adopted by the state of Venezuela, regarding the fulfillment of the consumptive um, opinion in terms of equal marriage for trans women, respect towards uh, gender identity is the key right, the right to have rights. Also, the commission, we disagree with the different uh, resolutions, 12020 and 12021, the last one, we are uh, monitoring the impact of the pandemics in the Americas with a perspective of uh, inter-American standards. And in resolution 12020, we made 86 recommendations, five recommendations for LGBTI persons, highlighting trans women, trans persons, the degree of exposure and the together with the special rapporteurship we fostered a report for uh, trans women and trans persons and for to us it would be very important to receive more information as, as i heard that there has been an increase in hate crimes the virtual world also poses this challenge before us hate is transnational and this uh, speech violence uh, is increasing and it violates certain rights. Secondly, the judicial power and uh, we gender violence. I took down notes of the lack of trust of women regarding justice. When institutional channels are used, 
sometimes they suffer institutional violence because they lack a gender perspective. There is another uh, kind of violence perpetrated by the state, and the result is the impunity in cases where women, trans women, uh, adolescents, and girls are the victims. So I would like to understand regarding uh, violence due to prejudice um, skewed by gender stereotypes. The lack of uh, perspective in terms of uh, gender diversity, for example, the case Azul Rojas Marin against uh, Peru, the court uh, is very emphatic when it comes to requesting detailed information to the states. This is a great challenge to gather statistics from the state official statistics so I could like to better understand this regarding the judicial power and also the composition of the uh, judicial power. Taking into account the reports of the commission, we are uh, concerned about judicial independence, the influence of the executive power on the other branches. And it is important for us to know the degree of judicial independence, the, the composition, if women are represented, what the representative of the permanent mission has highlighted, women empowerment in these spaces, the judicial power, the executive power, and legislative power. So these are my questions. Thank you. And we appreciate this moment for the commission. It's very important to work with the gender perspective in a transversal way. And every policy needs to take into account a gender perspective, our experiences, our struggles, our cases and causes. Thank you. I will now give the floor to Commissioner um, Arosamena, reporter on children's rights. Thank you, Madam First Vice President, Commissioner. I am the country reporter and also reporter for the rights of children. And I would like to thank you, especially for all this information, expressing my solidarity for your effort, for your work. This suffering when a state provides no answer before this extreme crisis, as you have explained, that is multidimensional. There is not one sector in Venezuela that is not undergoing that situation of crisis. I'm going to, I think Ophelia was mentioning this. I'm going to say something about this topic in particular. Because there are laws, there are norms. We need to identify how the legislative body, the judicial order works to deal with each of these situations that you have mentioned, including justice, of course. The ambassador Carré was saying that this are just words that these laws should be complied with. The justice system has a duty to provide a reply. What are the means, the channels to denounce the lack of uh, answer from the justice system? There are no channels because as you were saying, it is influenced by the executive. So we need to identify and 
and present all these complaints and review how the Venezuelan state needs to respond to provide and what has what has to be done in order for the state to provide an answer to those complaints the dialogue was interrupted this uh, process recovery process and i'm asking the permanent mission in the before the OES, are there women in this space are women part of this process of dialogue that is on hold in order to raise their voices about these topics. We know the political, social, humanitarian crisis Venezuela is undergoing is not limited to political issues and not limited to the political world, but to the democratic institution, institutionality. So I am concerned, deeply concerned, about how the international community, international organizations such as the Inter-American Commission can raise this flag. We have the reports. You know, there is a complex situation regarding the American convention that has been denounced by Venezuela and the instrument that is our strength is the American convention, the American declaration. And we are going through an experience dream situation and the evangelist and their response we can give so that we can fulfill these objectives. This is a comprehensive perspective, but I would like to receive further information about two things regarding the dead of the adolescents regarding their response and this uh, issue regarding transplants. What does the health system say in this case? There have been complaints filed regarding incapacity, the situation of lack of answer regarding the lives of girls, boys, and adolescents. We have information hard declarations made by adolescents, the, an adolescent who died, who said, I don't know if I'm going to die. And two weeks later, we knew that he had died because he did not receive the transplant. These are extreme situations that cause anger because I feel powerless to deal with this, that is the defense of human rights. So I would like to know whether you have data we know that you have limitations to gather that information, but we need those data. You mentioned orphan children, their situation. I would like to know whether you are aware of the fact, if you are aware of your situation, whether they're being kidnapped, sent to shelter homes and some of them are being used and are being sold internationally. This is a terrible situation. 
not only for orphan kids, but I believe that in particular, these children are undergoing this situation. And I want to conclude by pointing out, by telling you a personal story. 1996, Venezuela was rich and we were present in the World Congress of Family Rights discussing the rights of women. So how is the academia supporting your struggle, your protest? I would like to know what is like the participation of the professionals of the academia when it comes to raising this flag and this voice. Thank you. I am sorry I use up so much time, but for me, the situation of Venezuela is a situation for which I do not see a way out. The ambassador was saying that when we return to democracy, the struggle needs to continue until we can guarantee his rights, but we cannot wait. We need answers today because a country cannot be undergoing this situation. I'm sorry. Don't worry, Commissioner. Commissioner Lasemena is not only the country rapporteur, but while she was president of the commission, we travel and we were together in Cúcuta and in Bogotá, we tried to enter the country and we had the opportunity to face very hard times. And we were together listening to the testimony of this girl who said, I don't want to die, but unfortunately because of the lack of a transplant, she died. Uh, so don't feel bad, Commissioner. We work for rights, but we work with our heart. That's like that. Um, I want to make some questions. And if I take more time or take up more time, we're going to reduce our time in our next intervention. I would like to thank all of you for being here. Apart from the cases that you have mentioned, we would like to know whether you have received or you have been victims of any type of persecutions or your families. In the case of migrant women, girls, and adolescents, I would like to know if you could identify a pattern of this uh, sexual abuse, violence against them because of their direct role or for being family members of the of people who oppose the current regime. I would like to know if there are any cases of migration because of that. And also I would like to know the situation of return girls, those who return because they want it or because of the COVID-19 situation. I guess that Special Rapporteur Soledad will talk about this, but I would like to see how is the level of access to health services or contraception methods or hygiene. Uh, um, products for women, everything that has to do with sexual and reproductive rights of women. Um, we had a testimony that what they took when they were migrating, uh, women in Venezuela, they took contraception pills because during migration, they wanted to avoid pregnancy. I don't, we would like to know if you have any information about that. And I have a specific question for the state. I understand the specific situation. Uh, and I would like to know whether the representation to the OAS have thought in, uh, any pronouncement re or to request a specific meeting regard, uh, before the permanent council. We know that the ambassador is not able to give a specific response, but maybe they can make a pronouncement. So that's what I wanted to know. Now I would like to give the floor to Secretary Tania Renault. Thank you, Madam President. I have two questions to ask. First, I would like to thank civil society organizations for uh, sharing with us publicly the crisis faced by women in Venezuela. When we talk about Venezuela, uh, we think about the political crisis, we think about the food crisis, the migration crisis, the displacement, the crisis of political 
opponents, but it's sometimes difficult uh, to think about women uh, and their crisis if we don't have data. Sometimes women are the ones that have to absorb the shock of those political crises because they have to share their food, because they do not have institutions that protect them. I have two questions. First, I would like to understand that the criminal justice system is fragmented and it's not protecting women. I don't know if the criminal justice system protects women in any other country, but we would like to know how you resist and how you take care, how you build these spaces within this context that you are describing. And the second question is about if there is any regulation regarding sexual work. And I would like to know if it's prohibited or I understand that it's not regulated, but I would like to know if there are any prohibitions regarding sexual work. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Secretary. I would like to ask the Assistant Executive Secretary of Monitoring, Maria Claudia Pulida, would you like to add any questions? Good morning to all those persons that are participating in this digital hearing. And first, I would like to express my solidarity and to recognize uh, you for your courage for representing here today this information in a context that is so complex. And the Commission has been reporting this context for uh, some time now. The Commission is working on preparing two reports, a country report and all this information will be very important, very relevant. And we are also preparing a thematic report in order to identify the causes of human mobility and the massive uh, waves or flows of people migrating out of Venezuela. And also we would like to see the situation of Venezuelan migrants in different countries of the region. And we think that this issue is fundamental um for both reports and all the information that you have will be very important for us and we would like also to know the recommendations that you think that should be fundamental for the commission to formulate in its country report and also in the thematic report that will account for that uh human mobility crisis that is one of the biggest in the world right now thank you madam president Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to a special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, all. I would like to greet the ambassador and also thank you to all the organizations for all the information that you have given us and for making emphasis on the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela and including this gender perspective on the situation of women there. Uh, the data you have shared with us are very evident because what we are seeing is that all Venezuelan population is living in poverty. We would like to have more information regarding the feminization of poverty and how this structural situation of poverty is affecting women, especially. You were giving some very specific and dramatic examples. You were saying that some women have spent 14 years of their lives without access to drinking water. And all that means uh, in terms of time, in terms of uh, the effort that they have to make. You, sh you have mentioned the food crisis or also you mentioned the care crisis. Women have this extra burden and how the education system is also collapsed in Venezuela. I had some questions regarding the specific context of the pandemic do you have any information regarding differentiated access to vaccines for women i'm really concerned especially because of the situation not only of women who uh, need to go to the health system because of covid19 or because of chronic diseases also i would like to know sexual and reproductive health care and some, I would like to know the situation of those women who suffer breast cancer. We know that there are some precautionary measures granted by the commission. And we see that these days, some these women are desperate because they don't have access to the treatment or the medicines that they need. And the same 
is happening with regard to uh, another important me precautionary measure of the commission that is for Concepcion Palacios. And we have also identified this lack of fuel that you were pointing out. And I'm really concerned about what do you know about the social programs that are there? What happened with clubs boxes and if the um, Patria card, let's say, or the Madeline or Fatherland uh, card, um, it, that is it still there. We need to re recall or to uh, remind ourselves that Venezuela is part of the or is the signatory of the Belém do Pará Convention. And it's important to highlight that violence against women affects their economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Thank you, Rapporteur. Now I would like to give the floor to the representatives of the organizations. We have 10 minutes, but we are going to adapt the minutes given by the state so you can develop all the pending issues that you have there and also to, uh, you will be able to answer our questions. You have the floor. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Magdimar León. I belong to the Asociación Venezolana para una Educación Alternativa. We would like to thank you for being here. We made several attempts and for us, it's very important to be able to share with you information regarding the situation of women's rights in our country. Uh, I would like to supplement some of the information that was provided by my colleagues. I would like to share information regarding sexual and reproductive rights. And also, I would like to answer some of the questions that were asked in that sense. It's important to highlight the issue of maternal death in Venezuela. That is one of the main indicators of development and the guarantee of human, women's rights. As you said, you know that there is a situation with a Maternidad de Concepcion Palacios, Palacios and that precautionary measure. And we have a very serious situations in that regard. Since 2017, we don't have official figures regarding maternal death. And the last data that we're receiving showed an increase I think that we are having a problem of connectivity. We see that is an increase of 50 percentage points of maternal death. These data are different from the information that civil society and health institutions have. There is a study of Maternidad Concepcion Palacios that showed that there was an increase of 91.5 percentage points of maternal death between 2017 and 2018. And another uh, study conducted by a hospital uh, said that maternal death increased from 21 percentage points or increased by 21 percentage points between 2018 and 2020. And those data are different from those that the state has presented. If we relate this to the questions that you were asking. We see that there are only a few possibilities for women to control their reproduction. This is a very critical situation in terms of access to contraception methods. We see that it's an 80% of free contraception methods. And those that are at the market are really expensive and they are, cannot be afforded by most of the Venezuelans. According to a study conducted by Alianza Salud para Todas, we found that 90% of adolescents and women between 14 and 49 years old of popular communities in the center of the countries do not have access to family planning or to pregnancy planning. And only 14% can make informed decisions regarding their sexual and reproductive health. We see that this lack of access to contraception methods and services has led to several undesired pregnancies. And also we see an increase in the number of unsafe abortions. We see that uh, according to one of the studies, 
uh, at the global level says that Venezuela has the highest rate of uh, child pregnancies or adolescent pregnancies. And this high rate also is related to the levels of sexual violence and sexual trafficking and women trafficking. That is a reality. And this shows that there is a high level of unsafe pregnancies or undesired pregnancies and abortions that are not safe. We don't have exact figures regarding the number of abortions that are being performed. Um, there is a regulatory framework that is very restrictive. And we know that today abortions are being performed in very unsafe conditions. And that means that women are at a high risk in many areas. However, the committee of this um, CEDAW and the office of the high commissioner called upon the state, but the legal norms that uh, sanction abortion has not been changed, especially uh, not even for cases of sexual violation. Finally, I would like to highlight that instead of adopting measures to revert these serious issues, what the state has done is to um, use this information to exercise control over the sexual and reproductive autonomy of women. The state of Venezuela has been offering free sterilization for women in reproductive age that with low economic resources. These women take or accept these programs in order to avoid undesired pregnancies because of the situation that we live in the country, but also they are being co-opted by the context. We understand that this is a way of reproductive violence that is exerted by the state. In addition, um, the organizations who have documented these facts uh, have identified that these days of sterilizations are conducted in unsafe conditions and um, not with a pattern. Also, it's important to see that uh, women in Venezuela are trapped in a poverty cycle and they are lacking autonomy on their body and regarding their reproductive rights. Thank you, and I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, special rapporteur, executive secretariat. We are grateful for the questions you have asked. And there's a long list of problems that are putting many uh, re rights at risk. We want to take advantage of this space in order to request uh, the commission. We have taken down notes of your questions. We will uh, provide a written report in order to reply them. And we would like to present the uh, list of our requests, understanding the importance of the commissions following up the human rights situations in Venezuela, in particular, the situation of the rights of women, girls, and adolescents. And we have made a list of uh, requests that are related to the crisis that we're going through. The organizations, in a respectfully way, would like to say that it is urgent and necessary to strengthen in a transversal way with a gender approach, all the mechanisms in order to make visible all the setbacks and how far women, girls and adolescents are from uh, guaranteeing the right of living a life uh, free of violence. As the special reporter has highlighted, it's important for this analysis to be focused on the uh, measures uh, implemented by the state take into account the Belén do Pará Convention and the Venezuelan state is still part of that treaty. We consider that the special mechanism for Venezuela, Meseve, has a specific uh, round table to work on the rights of women, a space to enable the participation of uh, women organizations all over the country in order to establish an agenda to follow up this situation. Secondly, we request the commission to work closely in a coordinated way with other human rights mechanisms, especially within the framework of the United Nations. Uh, for example, the periodic uh, analysis that will take place in 2022, and also the assessment carried out by the CEDAO committee. 
also the facilitation of bilateral dialogue uh, discussion with the organizations and other to share the information that has received as the country reporter has pointed out this is a valuable way of visualizing human rights uh, women's violations in the international sphere also we request the commission to take into account the information presented in this hearing for the next uh, report presented before the inter-american uh, court in the case of venezuela as it is related with the lack of compliance of the measures uh, that has been decided by the court Fourth, we request the commission that when it comes to analyzing the situation of Venezuela and the context of human mobility in the region, they take into account that the risk and vulnerabilities they are facing is addressed in a way that it includes a human rights and gender approach in order to um, monitor the continuous uh, violence uh, they face when migrating to other countries. Also, we request the Commission to express resolutions regarding precautionary measures uh, that are related to the differentiated impacts and uh, the violence suffered by women and girls, and it has been pointed out in the case of uh, Palacios. precautionary measures such as that one are not complied with. These tools would be very useful for uh, organizations, other actors in international mechanisms to identify critical points of attention for humanitarian protection. And also to uh, restate the uh, highlight to the state their particular duties. Also, we request the commission to carry out specific activities in Venezuela to address the topics pointed out, for example, the judicial power, Ministry of Women, in order to have a dialogue to follow up the implemented mechanisms, also to guarantee the uh, safety of human rights defenders in the country. We express our concern for the safety of the um, human rights defenders that participate in this hearing. That's why we request the commission uh, to uh, make a call on the state to protect human rights defenders. Our rights should be at the center of the discussion. There cannot be democracy and rule of law without us. What we have pointed out in this hearing is just the first picture of the situation of women in Venezuela that imply um, a setback in the rights. And this involves all political actors who so far have not recognized that this is an urgent and priority agenda. The attempts of dialogue in Mexico, the so-called feminist government hardly committed to carry out efforts in order to uh, implement this agenda. The uh, commission is led by a majority of women, and it's the first time there's a woman in charge of the executive secretariat. We then hope that there is a commitment from the commission in regards to the situation of women and girls in Venezuela who have not been able to uh, enjoy their rights in their own countries. Once again, thank you for granting this hearing. Thank you. I will now give the floor to the state for 10 minutes. They had pointed out that they wanted to give the space to the civil society, if I'm not mistaken. But as there were specific questions to the state, and the civil society has concluded their participation, right? So the representatives of the state have the floor. First of all, I would like, as a woman, one second, as a woman, a member of the permanent mission, I would like to thank the commission for this hearing that has been requested by feminist organizations that defend women's rights, adolescents and girls that are here uh, present today. 
we want to thank them and recognize their work in order to achieve justice and make visible the serious uh, human rights situation for women in Venezuela. This dialogue has uh, enabled us to identify human rights violations regarding women and adolescents in Venezuela. We have heard them and we recognize the failures uh, of the shortcomings of the state and we share the pain caused by impunity. That's why it is important to recover democracy, to guarantee rule of law and the independence of powers. This requires structural deep changes in the institutions of the state, and it is a commitment that not only the interim government has to uh, assume, but all the, uh, the, the, the um, future governments and the society as a whole. You have shown your bravery, then you spoke loud, you were heard, and media outlets uh, are expanding the message, spreading their message. You are being heard within your country and the hemisphere. Your reports show uh, an increase in the vulnerability of Venezuelan women, an increase in the violence they suffer during the last uh, years that has been exacerbated by um, judicial delays and the impunity before the perpetrators that cause discrimination. I'm not going to continue speaking about what we have heard from the petitioners. I want to provide an answer to some of the questions that are pending. Democracy, the struggle for democracy is strongly related to the fight for women's rights. We depend on that freedom, on that institutionality the recovery of the rule of law in order to continue with this struggle that we share and that we support not only from the OAS, but to all of you. I would like to say that inequality in the decision-making position is has become evident in the conversations uh, carried out in Mexico in order to find a way out to the crisis, humanitarian and complex crisis. We only have two female representatives. It's a team made up by more than 30 persons and only two women. And regarding children, they are waiting for a transplant. Two have already died. Two who have resorted to the OES have died. And it's very hard to say this because they have come to find uh, here to find an answer and we were not able to save them. That's why the fight for democracy does not stop. It's every minute, every day. That fight for democracy is a fight for women's rights. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a reference to what Commissioner Rosamena said regarding the American Convention. And I could like to say that in 2019, the interim government ratified the convention. That's why cases can be dealt with according to the convention. And I also wanted to answer Commissioner Mantilla. Our mission wants to keep this dialogue active with the feminist civil society and to build a bridge between uh, the commission and the civil society in order to receive further information that we would not uh, have uh, without the civil society's work. And we want to thank everyone present for such an important hearing. Thank you. We are about to conclude the hearing. I want to thank the uh, Secretary Pulido, who sent me regulations. Article 63 establishes that the state should uh, provide all guarantees to everyone that participates in a hearing or provides evidence, uh, testimonies, or uh, information to the commission, and that the state cannot act against all the uh, experts 
uh, that have participated or everyone that has provided information during a hearing. We are uh, closing the hearing now. We wanted to make a request. This is a historical moment for the organizations in Venezuela. We wanted to uh, make a request to take a picture. No, no worry, we will, no worries, we will do it afterwards. I read this article in order to remind at an international level, because I know that this hearing is being watched by many persons, the protection, the role the commission has in that regard. I want to conclude this hearing by concluding by thanking the representatives that have participated uh, who have expressed the willingness to keep on supporting and listening to women, but in particular to each of the women present, not only for being here, but for your uh, struggle. And I also want to thank and send my solidarity and the commitment of the Inter-American Commission to each of the persons that are watching and the Venezuelan people, the women, the girls that are watching. The commission will keep on working. I recall the advisory opinion issued by the Inter-American Court when it says that, in, that these are use Cohen's uh, norms and when rights, women's rights are not respected, when gender violence is not recognized, where there is no equal participation, we are uh, attempting, uh, we are attacking this principle. There is no democracy without women, and we agree with what you have said. We are taking the notes of each of your requests. We will incorporate that in our reports, and undoubtedly, Secretary Tanya Renault, Ado Secretary, have taken down notes of this request that are going to be incorporated in our work. And undoubtedly, there's no democracy without women. And as we always say, what is not good for women is not good for democracy. So following that line, we are going to keep on working. Thank you once again. Have a nice day. And we will end the hearing now. And we will stay for one minute to take the picture as Elena has requested. One, two, three. Just one more, because I have two screens. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.